Welcome to Teach Like a, well, Train Like a Champion. It could be Teach Like a Champion, but it's one of those things. I was going to put the Eurovision um, song contest one up there, but I, I think people who have seen that have had enough <laughs> for the last week or two. Uh, welcome today to a um, look at what makes a great teacher. My, my teaching career is in its late 30s which I often acclaim to, but I'm in my late 30s as well, I'm 62. But when I first started teaching, I used to look at other teachers and think, I wish I was as good as them. Who, know that, who knows that first year of lecturing or teaching and there's so much stuff to do and there's so much paperwork and you cry a lot when no one can see you and you just get through it and you go, I wish I was that good. And then I think as teaching went along, I, I knew what worked. I knew what was good. I, I knew that if I did this, I got a good response. But I didn't know why. And then I met a lady I shouldn't have fallen in love with, a lady called Carol Cooper, who was tall, American, skinny, gay, <laughs> beautiful woman. And she taught me about alignment. And alignment, in her words, were very simple. There were five things that made great work work. And they were simple little things. They were non-cognitive things that I should have known as a teacher. And they were pretty simple. Always put your team face to face at some stage. So do this. Turn to the person next to you. Pat them on the back and say, it's good to see you today. <laughs> and uh, as you notice then, I just did a little check. I was scanning to see who gets along with who. Some people went, yes! And some people went, oh, don't I have to sit next to you? Some people are still doing it. <laughs> Lucky. But little things like that made a biggest difference. The next thing she said is, great teaching works when you teach people the social skills you need to work with. Isn't that interesting? Because I never realised that, that you actually train them how to behave, not just teach them stuff. So you teach them little social skills that makes them work together. So, you know, how are you going to work together? And then I, I, I just came up with a basic little set of social skills that I'd work with. Just put up your left hand, I'll go through them quick. If, have a look at your people around you. If they haven't got their hand up, just elbow them, right? First one, look after little people. People who don't know stuff. Help them out. You're a team. We're here together today to try and learn an awesome thing about train like a champion. I will not be happy unless you all learn it. Understand? If there's someone in your group who's not working, help them out. Next one. What's on here? Wedding ring. That's been there for 40 years. I've been in love with a beautiful woman for 40 years and I still love her with all my heart because she's hot. But <laughs> the reason why I love Kate is because always do your best, for better, for worse, in sickness and in health, till death you part. I know until the day I die, Kate will always do her best for me, right? So that means I always do my best for her. If you do your best, I don't care. I love errors, I love mistakes, but if you're not doing your best, I'll kick you back. Next bit, do this one quick. No put-downs. Don't use <laughs> three types of put-downs. Don't use killer put-downs. I hate you. You're stupid. You've got a smelly big butt. Often dressed up as a joke. Most workplaces are tarnished by, by stupid jokes, right? Words that are used all the time. I have used them myself and got bad reviews for them. But we do it sometimes without thinking and it's lethal. No silent put-downs. I will not take eye-rolling. Sighing, <sighs> folded arms and looking away, or hair flicking. <laughs> yes, I work with 15 year olds, you know what I mean. <laughs> and no self put downs. I will not take, I cannot do this, I'm pathetic, I'm cute. Get over it. You won't always be cute. I used to be cute once. Look what happened. 
I will not take, I'm dumb, I'm stupid, I can't do this. Shy. No put downs. Ask for help. Get directions. And know the rules. I like mistakes. There's no mistake that you can make that I haven't seen before. I love mistakes. We've got to create cultures of error if we want our places to be excellent. The trouble is, is we get this faux bulldust that you get all through training, which is AQTFD in, and it's the image of it all. And we try to be perfect. Perfect is the enemy of good. If I can get your best from you, then I can make you excellent. If I can get one of you to be good, then I can make the rest of you excellent because you can see what they can do and you can get that skill. But if we're trying to be perfect, we're never going to answer. We're never going to tell enough truth to get good. Listen. I expect eye contact, no speaking, hand still, remembering what you said. And have fun. But you can't have fun until you've got all of these because if we've got one person in this team who doesn't do these things, we don't have fun. I've got to be the boss. And I do kick butt. I do it nicely, but I do kick it. And finally, mutual respect. Put up your left hand like that. Turn to the person next to you, give them a left-handed high five. <laughs> now, if you're a left-hander, you just went, at last! <laughs> and if you're a right-hander, you went, oh, that feels so limp-wristed. Because mutual respect means you don't have friends at, school, at work, you are friendly to everyone. The well, of the worst things that happen in TAFE and, and all of those types of institutions are happened where there's a clique of people who don't talk to each other. Got my social skills? Carol's rules were fairly simple. Get people face to face, teach them the social skills, find out what they're thinking. You noticed I came in and shook your hand when you all sat down. That's, that is a definite tactic of great lecturers. Great people embrace the people they work with. They meet them at the door. G'day, how are you? Good to see you today. And they may not shake your hand, but they know who you are and they use your name and they use those things to work it through. And how do we get people to do that? Good relationships. Because it gets the thinking out, not in. I want to hear what you're saying. Then the next one was, so we've got... Get face to face with people, teach them the social skills, share your thinking, work together. The best training happens when you make people work together. And the scary part about that is do things like, here's one piece of paper and here's one pen, I want you to take notes between the two of you. One of you will write, the other will help and then change over. Every time we do stuff that way, you have to pay attention. You've got to know what's in your notes and you've got to share them at the end so you've got to talk about them twice. And then hold them accountable. At any time you work with me, I will pick on you. I don't have hands up. I pick on the scared ones first. And if I make you cry, good. If I get you upset, terrific. Get embarrassed, you won't do that again. Get your boss in, we'll have a chat. Because I believe my work is important. And I believe that when you learn from someone, you've got to believe there's an accountability involved. And the weird stuff is you can't keep, hold people accountable for attitude, can you? You can hold them accountable for the work, but the big stuff means we've got to create an accountability within ourselves that makes it work. Those are five simple things that I learned 14 years into my teaching career. Totally changed what happened. Because as soon as I did a workshop and it didn't work, or as soon as I did a, a lesson that didn't work, or as soon as I taught something, I had five things to look at and say, what did I muck up? But I was still floundering. And the reason why is because I like to share stuff. Who likes to share stuff? When you get something cool, you want to share it. And people would say, have you got this written down somewhere? And I was in the somebody order, you know, somebody ought to write this down. Somebody ought to write a, write a book about what makes good teaching. Well, somebody did. So that's what I'm sharing with you today. What somebody awesome wrote about teaching. 
Because have you ever looked at a teacher and just stood out from the crowd? You know those people? Who's had one of those teachers in their lives? Probably changed the way you saw everything. All that sort of stuff. And you looked at them and you thought, how do they do that? It looks impossible. You notice that There's, there can be groups of people you see stand, somebody stands up in front of a group of kids and these kids are tearing people apart and that person goes, oh, do I can't do this and they slowly, slowly kill you. And then another lecturer just steps up and goes, everybody, and everybody goes, Yeah, what's going on here? This is stupid. And it's kind of non-cognitive. It doesn't make sense. But this guy, Doug Lemov, was in charge of an organisation called Uncommon Schools in the United States. They're a charter school. Charter schools were designed by the American government because they're like canaries in mines. You know how canaries in mines work? When there's noxious gases, they fall over. They had a lot of trouble trying to fix up the United States government teaching system because it's so disparate and so different and so widespread. And they found they were wasting so much money and they were trying some really dumb ideas like, this school isn't working so we're going to bus all of these kids from a school that's not working into this school that is working. Didn't work just made the good schools worse. So they thought, why don't we have some experiments? We'll send out charters. Charters are schools who said we're going to target this group of kids and try and do this with them. Limov's uncommon schools was to get poor kids to college because America does it so badly. Only 9% of their poor kids actually reach college. Much lower than Australia's percentage and stuff like that. So what they did is they gave them a bucket full of money. They went out and bought real estate, usually in the poor areas of town because you've got more real estate there and that's where the poor kids were. Did them up beautifully, hired the best teachers they could find, gave them a good pay and said, go for it. <laughs> but six months in, the teachers went, thanks for that. <laughs> How do you do it? And Lemov, who's a really smart man because he's, he's not like me at all, he's quite an introvert, went, I don't know. Which is a really wise thing to say, isn't it? I don't know. Let's find out. So he looked around and the one thing they got in the United States that is coming out of everywhere is called data. Although over there they call it data. They've got data about everything, every school, every class, from kindergarten all the way through to whatever. And it's all written down and it's all legal and it's all measured and that sort of stuff. In Australia, we only got one level of that. That's called NAPLAN and that causes great levels of angst, doesn't it? I go into year ones. I, I, I go into year ones all the time and say, who can read? And year ones go, I can! Even if they can only read one word, they read it well. And they're excited about it. I love them. You go into year three now and say, who can read? And they go, well, I used to think I could, but then I got my NAPLAN results and I'm crap. And I'm crap Australia-wide. And mum's freaked out and taken me, to the, taken me to the psych and now I've got a label all over me which says I'm useless, so... We've got the most anxious generation of kids ever. And if you work in a TAFE, you see you've got anxious parents with anxious kids and the kids aren't getting jobs, so you get the serial kids who enrol in everything and they're doing left-handed knitting for gay whales because it's a, <laughs> it's a cause and we better get in there because everybody's got to get a job, you know, because we're worried. Whereas kids like me who are dyslexic and didn't know it just kept going. I've got an ambition to write a paragraph without making a mistake. That's my big aim in life. I haven't made it yet. I think anybody who spells the same word the same way twice is boring. 
I didn't know. I just kept going until I got good at something, right? And heaven forbid it ended up in teaching. I found the passion. But what happens with most of our kids these days is that we don't use the data enough because there's three types of changes you get in schools and three types of changes you get in training. Some of it's opinion-based. New director comes in and says, we're going to do it this way. Pfft, okay. You're the director. You're the boss. Some of it is research-based, but just because somebody did this in northern Queensland, it doesn't mean that it's applicable here for you in this place. And then there's data-driven research. But we use it the wrong way. Lemov used it the right way. He went, let's find the teachers who actually teach this demographic of kids well. And let's look for the high data bubbles. You know, the ones not just above state average, but above national average. People who are doing something great and let's go and look at them. So that's what they did. And they found them all over the states and they were these little bubbles and often they were isolated trainers and teachers. Isn't that interesting? Because as soon as you get good, everybody else hates you. Go into the staff room and go, look, I'm a fabulous trainer and see what happens. Just put out, I'm having a wonderful day on Facebook, see what comes back. What sort of drugs are you on, man? What we want to look for is how do we get great performance? And so they went to these teachers and they did two great things. They interviewed them which is you can interview any trainer because they're always awesome in the staff room, aren't they? But then they did a marvellous thing. They went and they videoed them teaching. And then they analysed it. And Lamov said, I just caught great, caught great teaching and wrote it down. And they noticed that there were a succession of strategies that these great teachers used. Not all of them used these, all of these strategies, but most of them had a core of the same ones that kept coming back again and again, and he found 49 of them. Couldn't find 50, had to find 49 of them. Beautiful number, square number. And then he wrote them down. And he gave them little names. He gave them stuff that would work for them. And he said, it's not about the trainer, it's what the trainer does. And it's not about the ones, you can't say, oh, we're going to get better teachers because it doesn't work. You've got to train the people you've got. And then you find out that there's a structure underneath what looks so simple. When you look through, you find that it, there are little tricks and tests. And there are some people who have just got magical skills, aren't they? Look at that. Isn't that brilliant? I don't know how far he went with that, but oh, how awesome is that? And he wrote a book called Teach Like a Champion. And my challenge, this is the world's worst Photoshop. There you go. What I've done with it is that I've taken it out to a groups of trainers. I think we've done Kununurra did some and Broom did some. And for a small amount of people who see it go, oh, this makes sense for us too. Because it tells you what do you do to get high expectations. What, what are the planning decisions that you need to make? Uh, and what, how do you structure and deliver lessons? And what do you do to engage students and create a strong classroom culture and have high behavioural expectations and build character and trust. Those are the big non-cognitive stuff that defines all of your training, isn't it? Whatever the content is, it's pretty much content free. And basically he said, you don't have to do all of this, but I want you to find some stuff that you can use. Because trainers will be the choice of, teachers will be the choice of use what works for them. Pretty simple. So, we're going to have a look through these and see if I can explain them in a short period of time. But first, you need to find a partner. Now, if you sit still for too long, your mind wanders. Who just had lunch? And who's in a different spot where they normally are? 
And who's finding this chair very comfortable? Time to change. I change kids regularly because the two biggest drives in most organisations, sex and territory. When you get to my age, bed and shed. So <laughs> what this is about is that people seek dominance. Now, if you teach little kids, this is very obvious. You ever seen a year, year three sit down? 800% increase in testosterone age eight. They go from unleaded to rocket fuel. And when they sit down, they do this. They sit down and go... Well, they just piddle on every post, right? <laughs> and you'll be talking to them and they'll be going... And you say, put that down. <laughs> put that down. Put that... Because they're maintaining control of their territory. Men are all about domination. Being the boss. If you work with men, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. They take up space. They do man-spreading. You know man-spreading? <laughs> they do mansplaining. Look, I'll tell you how you should do that. The way it should be done is... They don't do it because they're nasty. That's just how we've been trained, right? If you want to work with a group of difficult people, move them around quite a bit. They'll complain because schools are different, right? Primary schools are like women's brains. Everything is connected to everything. <laughs> and it runs on emotions. Everybody knows how you feel and what's going on. High schools, men's brains. Everything's in a box. Maths doesn't talk to English. English doesn't talk to... TAFEs and training institutions, autistic men's brains. <laughs> Not only are we in our box, we're very, very interested in this one. In fact, we're obsessive with it and we don't talk to anybody else's box either. The key is, is that you need people to work together for them to happen. So there's three ways I could group you. I could choose the group, you could choose the group, or God could choose the group. If I choose the group, you go, oh, do I have to work with him? If you choose the group, I'll go, oh, do you have to work with him? <laughs> and if God chooses the group, you go, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because you might end up with a dud. Excellent. If any group that I work with over periods of time, I will not have people on the outer. They must be in the team. They've got to learn how to do it. And I don't care if they're different and they don't like it and stuff like that. We'll find a way to accommodate them. Because as soon as you change the room, you change the vibe completely. Because they're usually sitting with their mates or they're sitting with the people that they want to work with. And some will tell you, yeah. you're shaking your head going, I haven't got any friends. <laughs> That's good. People will be friendly to everyone. And today I'll help fix you. But it's one of those things. Simple. Have a look around the room. Now, how are you going to do it? It's pretty simple. Find a pair of eyes, lock onto those eyes, sun deep, and just go... And then walk towards them. <laughs> you did a wonderful job. Because normally, you see, normally what happens is you look at someone and go, and I'll go, oh, God. <laughs> but the trouble is with that is that I want that. I want that little bit of uncomfortability. I don't want my students to be comfortable because when they're comfortable, they're not putting in. I want them to be safe. I want them to feel like you could go to anybody in this room and you could learn from them. Wouldn't that be awesome? And sure, it's going to be uncomfortable. You might not know them. They might come from a different culture, heavens. They might have different ways of talking or different ways of looking at things. You might think, well, this is okay for you because you're an extrovert and I'm an introvert. No. We're all here to learn. Pretty simple. Let's create a safe emotional environment that you can see, S-E-E. -E. And watch it, because sometimes I might go... G'day. <laughs> if that happens, you stand up and go... And you're looking around for someone else who's going... Because they're your partner. Watch as the good partners go quick. <laughs> you must sit with someone from a different table. Ooh. 
figure it out. You've got 30 seconds to be sitting down next to someone else. Go. Yeah, well, you can stay there, but you never know who's going to turn up. Up the back, up the back. <laughs> okay. Now, that was interesting in itself because can you feel a buzz in the room? We need to work on you. We need to work on you. But what happens is with it is you'll find that there's a buzz. And if you're working with culturally challenged 15-year-old narcissists, you know what narcissist spelt backwards is? I can't say it, it's rude. I'll go out. I'll say it nicely. Assholes. <laughs> but they're so self-centred, this might just shake the tree a little bit, couldn't it? Get it out of the peer group. And you'll find that they'll go... Do I have to? Yeah. And then you find halfway through it, they forget that they're talking to someone that they shouldn't be friends with and turn into kids again. Pretty simple. Did you do a quick intro? Know who the person is? Got the name? Institution? Where they're from? Cool, yeah. Yeah. Now, very simple stuff to do. Very simple stuff for trainers. If you're doing any corporate training or anything, do this. They all complain, but it works. It gets people with new friends. Right? And the key with it is that this is to make sure... Did you check out how your partner looked at you? Did they look at you like this? Okay. <laughs> Very good. Now, what I want to go through with you, and the reason for your partner is you need to process what we're doing. Because I'm going to go through these and then I expect you to explain them to each other. Does that make sense? So you don't just get it once from me, you get a repetition. Because you need lots of at-bats with your learning. I'm just checking out the people who didn't move. You didn't move up the back there, you too. Oh, he moved, yeah. I'm watching, don't worry, I noticed stuff. These two moved the least. But they did it so well. <laughs> First strategy that they found that great teachers used regularly was no opt-out. Don't have hands up. Ask anybody. Pick on them. What's the answer to this? Where did you get it from? What was the thing? And you'll get that look on people's eyes. Now, the key to this is that when we have no opt-out, you're supported. It goes like this. Can you remember the guy's name who wrote the book? No. Excellent. Say, I don't, know. I don't know. Excellent. Now, when a man says, I don't know, you celebrate. Because he's just gone from being unconsciously incompetent to consciously incompetent. <laughs> now you can teach him. See, this is important. Who could you find out from? Do you know? <laughs> you can say it. They say it in America as Doug Lemov. But we're Australian. Doug Lemov will do. But what happened there? Do you notice what we got from the no opt out? And who else was going, what was that name? I've got to get that. Because when we get hands up and stuff like that, what happens? Everybody else goes, oh, they're going to answer the question. And you're thinking, oh, great, I don't have to pick them out. I'll just look interested. <laughs> With little dudes, they go, yes, all right. And you go, what's the answer? And they go, 
I forgot. Because <laughs> we like to show off. Have right is right. Now, there's been a movement in education where you don't say that's wrong. You notice that? Because kids today are so frail when it comes to criticism. I had a kid in Western Sydney recently. We were playing a game. Remember that goody, oldie bit of goody called musical chairs? I do three versions of it. There's a competitive version. There's an individualised version where you sit down by yourself <laughs> according to a rubric that I haven't shown you yet. There's a cooperative version where all the chairs go out but you have to sit down on top of someone else. <laughs> so you have to make care of other people's differences and there is, a, there is an out clause if you know how to solve the problem which is basically you have to sit down on top of someone or in, in touch with someone who's on top of a chair which gives you a leg out. And then there's the uh, transformational musical chairs where there's no chairs and there's no music, but we all manage to sit down without touching the floor. It's quite exciting. This kid in competitive musical chairs is out first time. I say to him a descriptive term, right? You've lost, mate. You're a loser. Sit down over here. And it took us 15 minutes to talk him down. I said, I wasn't putting you down, I was just describing what happened to you. You are a loser is not a put down. It means you did not win. This is the problem with right is right. If you're right, you're right. If you're wrong, you're wrong. Don't kill the lily. That's it. Wrong, fix it. Didn't know, find out. This changes totally the rigour in a room, doesn't it? What you expect from people. And stretch it. If they know something, you can get to something good. Here's a very simple stretch it. What do you like to eat? Food. Food, okay. Nice general term. <laughs> so let's stretch it, right? First... Format matters, so when I ask kids to talk to me, I expect them to answer in a full sentence. Right? Why? Because we get so many kids who use one-word answers, don't we? If you work with Aboriginal kids, this is a problem because they've got to learn, and I hate to say it without apology, but the language of academic training is standard Australian English. It always is. All the safety information comes in it. It's the way it is. Sorry about that, but that's the way it is. So, can you put that in a sentence for me? I like to eat Italian food. I like to eat Italian food. Awesome. We've got a descriptor in there as well. We picked up just by doing that. Let's stretch it. Uh, let's make that, that. That's sort of like a primary school sentence. Let's get it up to a high school sentence, right? <laughs> so, I like to eat Italian food, and let's give it a because, because... That will give us a good reason, right? Oh, I like to eat Italian food because pasta is my passion. Okay. Do you want to take it up to training level? TAFE, uni, somewhere around there. Let's get up to a tertiary set. Let's go. I like to eat Italian food because pasta is my passion and... Okay, give me the whole sentence. I like to eat Italian food because pasta is my passion and I don't need to cook it myself. And I don't need to cook it myself. Isn't she wonderful? <laughs> Let's go to a genius sentence. <laughs> genius sentence, stretch it. We've got to stretch it. Here we go. I like to eat Italian food because pasta is my passion and I don't have to eat, cook it myself, but... Because this says you can do two sides of the sentence. Is that a genius? I love it when kids can see both sides of an argument. Don't you? Here we go. But. Nah, do the whole lot. <laughs> Hang on. I'll put you. Here we go. Let's sing. <laughs> we on? Here we go. Here we go. Genius. I like to eat Italian food. <laughs> 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 I like to eat Italian food because pasta is my passion and I don't need to cook it myself 
but I have a local, um, Il Prado, down the road, who um, has a special table for me every Wednesday night. <laughs> you are a true genius. Now, key with that, don't celebrate too much, right? <laughs> Kids get over praise, we want specific praise. Great sentence, right? One second party. Put your hands up like this. Round of applause. Now, it's a one second round of applause. Here we go, go. And that's enough. There's a whole range of these. Source of inspiration, tomato sauce bottle. You're looking good. Here we go. Zit, zit, zit. You're looking good. Don't do that with the trades apprentices. They get upset. <laughs> There's a whole range of those things, but just simple little acknowledgements of great things. But why, wasn't that good? And why was it good? Because it was specific to the stretch. See how stretch works? You've all got something you work on that you can stretch, that you can bring out. What is? Use the language. Stretch it up. Make sure the format works and don't apologise. If you're a lecturer and you're saying that's your job, right? Stop saying, I'm sorry, this is hard. And how many times do you give the game away? Look, I know this is really difficult, fellas, but, you know, that's it. <laughs> I can stuff up here. No. Don't apologise. You're good enough. I even heard a lecturer saying, I'm sorry, but I won't apologise for this. Oops. <laughs> Without apology, TTYPA, which stands for Turn to Your Partner and, see if you can explain the five of them. And go, turn to your partner. See if you can get them. Okay, let's pick, explain, format matters for me. Who can help me? Okay, so? There's a format. There's ways that we work. Now, your format might matter if you're working in a trade thing. There's a way that we do things. But the format and the way it works, works it out. Now, because I picked on you, suddenly everybody else is interested. They're all going, he's picking on people. Oh, I better do this. <laughs> Always reject self-reporting. So when you go, have you got that, guys? No. Show it to me. Hold it up. I love document readers in, in, in lecture theatre. Give me that work, I'll show it to everyone. Let's have a look. I tell you what, that improves things out of sight, right? Okay, now we're going to go quick. I've been slow up to now, we're going to get faster. Planning. Planning when we're planning for excellence. We want to begin with the end in mind. This is hard because when we have a look at most planning for training, it is about content. I have to get through this stuff. This is what it says. AQTF says, I've got to be here, right? The problem is with that is that's usually not the end in mind. You want to figure out how can I get them to that as quick as possible. So in a number of trades systems, they found that lecturing was particularly useless until they put it in a real setting. Until they started to have the, okay, we'll service your car and we'll have a uh, foreman and we will have an account at the locals and we will do this because then you start with the end in mind because you know what you're training for. In football terms, the Dockers are winning all the first quarters because they train for it. They don't go out and warm up, they go out and go flat out first up in their training. Why? 
because they started with the end in mind. We were losing those first quarters. Let's do it. You've got to think about what is the end I want with and train for that. And plan for the four M's. Figure out, first, is this meaningful? <laughs> How much stuff have you got in there that you could probably get rid of? Is it made first? Am I making my goals up first or I'm trying to make it as I go along and that's why I'm not getting anywhere? Is it measurable? So what am I going to measure? And is it most important? How, time, how many times do we get caught up in the trivia without going for the main point? Now, there are notes for these, if you're nice to me. In the break, I will give you all cards and stuff like that so you can get this from. You don't have to buy the book, although it is online and it's relatively cheap for what it gets. But this is all further explained in great detail. But post it. When you've got a goal, stick it on the wall. Make it so that they can see it. This is our goal. This is what we're on about. So you're always bringing them back to it, tapping the wall. And if they reach a goal, stick that on the wall if you can. I can show you some primary schools which put so many training institutions to shame because their learning is on the walls. I love it when a kid does a learning journey with their parents and it comes in. Instead of the interview with the lecturer or the teacher, the kid comes in and shows you what I've learnt and this is an example of it and here it is in my book and they take them around the room and can show them a whole term's work and the kid knows it all. Wouldn't that put so many training institutions to shame? Basically because we don't post it. It's got to be out there. If they learn it, show it. They love it. Students love to show off what they've learned. Figure out the shortest path, which is so obvious, but it's not. How do I get to point B from point A as quick as I could? Could I do it quicker? And double plan. What are we going to teach and how are we going to teach it? What are the strategies we're going to use? Do that in a team and you'll find your teaching improves out of sight, particularly if one of the team watches you. I drive better when there's a policeman in my rear vision mirror. Pretty simple. When you start to teach for each other, it gets better. But particularly if you double plan, then you can see I'm looking at that strategy, not the content. Oh, that was a good strategy. Can I steal that from you? Really important. And draw the map. Now, the map is what does the room look like whilst I'm working? How many times have we got things like lecture theatres where everything is nailed to the floor and we can't move it around? I still move students around. In my map here today was that you were going to work with someone else and I was going to move it. No matter what this organisation was, I knew that was in my map in the head. If you've got any writing to do, get them aligned facing outwards, not looking at anybody else because they can't write when someone's near them. I like desks around the outside facing outwards so that when they're working, they're alone. And then I can move them into the middle and work with them. But what this is saying is don't be a victim of your furniture. Don't be a victim of your room. Change it, fix it, move it. 30 seconds. Turn to your partner, see if you've got those ones. Talk. I know you haven't got the four M's, but you know. <laughs> Thirty seconds up. 
now. And we've got 15 minutes to go, so we're going to work hard. We've got uh, 30, uh, 38 things to get through in 15 minutes, so we're going to be double time. When we have a look at this, the interesting thing about it is use time to your advantage. Use timers. Say we're going to do this for 30 seconds and make it work. Make every second count because then you can get stuff done. The next one is a brace of, is a, a set of eight things about how to deliver a great lesson. Always have a good hook. Have something that when they come in, they know the hook. And name the steps about what's going to happen after that hook. Here's a great example. This is a man called Bobby McFerrin. You may have known him. He had a hit single with a song called Don't Worry. Be happy. He's also in his late 30s. He's 60 now. This is him with four uh, on stage at the World Science Festival with two, uh, with uh, three Nobel laureates and a lord. And he's explaining how expectations work. Talking about expectations? Expectations. What? Ba, 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 Regardless of where I am, anywhere, every audience gets that. But it doesn't matter, you know, that's just, you know, the pentatonic scale for some reason. If you're looking for a job in neuroscience, I think. <laughs> <laughs> you're looking for a job in neuroscience. Great hooks grab the brains. And if you come to the next session, which I fully encourage you to because I'm disruptive, uh, I'll show you a whole bag full of hooks for an hour because there's so many awesome ones out there that can turn the most bored group of kids into, oh, wow, I can't wait to go to this guy's lectures because they've got such cool things to look at. Simple things. Name the steps. Now, board and paper means how do I get them to capture the learning? So do I have to teach these guys how to take notes, keep notes, 
keep files if you've got laptops and stuff like that? Where do they keep the files? How do I know you've got the learning from me and you have processed it in some way, shape or form? Circulate. Get around the room. I promise to stay at the front of the room for the audience who are watching us online at the moment. Normally, I would have been around each of your tables. Great lectures. You've got to show the kids that you are watching, right? If you are not watching, they will do all sorts of evil things where you cannot see their hands. Get around. Show me it. Hold up the piece of paper that shows me that you've taken notes. Show me where the mistake is here. Where did you write that? Point to the error in this engine. Point to where this is. So you're on their shoulder and then break it down. If you see a problem, break it into little places. And change the ratio. You'll notice how I change the ratio with you by getting you to talk to somebody else. So that you're talking all the time. Ratio here is how much do they talk and how much do you talk? And check for understanding. Always be asking, how did you get that answer? Where did you get that from? Oh, that's a good answer. Has anybody got a better one? Let's see. Oh, you've got nothing on your page. Sort of stuff. At bats, give them lots of chances to talk to each other. Have an exit ticket. You can't leave here until this works a treat. You have to have something there. Good teachers use it judiciously, but kids know they must know what they have learnt at the end of it. Got it? And take a stand. Teach them how to stand up and defend their point of view. Who thinks they've got the best here? Good. Stand up and tell us why. Who disagrees with them? Stand up, and stand up and tell us about yours. Don't put theirs down and explain why yours would be better. Excellent strategies. Turn back to the partner quick. See if you can remember those. Yeah, there's a few there. Sorry, guys. I'm not sorry at all, actually. Okay. Did I lose someone there? I saw the door shut. It's okay. I'm tetchy. Give me one that you liked out of that, br that set. Ex check for understanding. Now, there is a 2.0 Teach Like a Champion, which is a sequel. So four years later... What happens, and they take check for understanding and turn it into a whole section, and they take ratio and turn it into a whole section because they're both that important. Ratio is the, the amount of time you talk and the amount of time your students talk. See how that little check there brings that out? That's exactly what we want. Give me one that you like. Take a stand. Take a stand is big. In fact, there's uh, PhDs now around the world where you can't just hand in your thesis. You have to be quizzed by six of your peers. Wouldn't that value, that adds value to your PhD, I reckon, by 100%. So where you have to be able to stand up and defend your position. It would be great if we did that in the staff room. I have got strategies for that if you want to learn them from me. They're really cool. Here we go. Now... Engaging students is not what you think. This is not the song and dance stuff, although one part of it is, that's the Vegas. Do some song and dance occasionally, right? But most of this is making sure the kids must be, the lecturers, the persons, 
must be engaged. So cold call. No hands up, I'm calling. Anyone, no opt out. If you're worried about that, make them stand up when you do that so they know it's coming. Call and response. In the hooks one, I'll show you a great call and response example. But basically, sometimes you might just want to do that to make sure they're paying attention. Here's a simple one. When I say class, you say yes. How I say class, you say yes. Class. Yes. Class, class, class. Yes, yes, yes. Class. Come on, do it. Class. Yes. Class. Yes. Class. Yes. Stupid, but it's fun, right? But then I get, teach, okay. Teach, teach. And then when you say, teach, okay, they turn to their partner and they turn them that way. That's a simple call and response. But it can be, oh, I do it for all sorts of things. Uh, six writing trays. Writing rule one, get a good idea. Okay, what's writing rule one? And then we go through... All of those, so that they learn those things in repetition after repetition, because you've all got stuff you want them to have on the tip of your tongue. Pepper, ask quick questions. What was the one that you liked? Give me a word. Red. Okay. Strategy that you liked? Uh, attack. Attack. <laughs> <laughs> I'll kill him. Give me a strategy you like. Ratio, cool. Give me another one. Take a stand, another one. So all this pepper is quick questions, quick questions, get them that pace in your thing. Wait time. If you've got hands up, you don't get wait time. So I'm going to ask you a question. I want you all to think. Think looks like this. When I pick on you, I want metacognition. So when you go, what's the answer? It's when you're thinking about your thinking, that's cool. Then I'll pick on anyone so that they don't know where it's coming from. If you've got hands up, you get the interruption on your question. I know, or they call out and then you don't get think time. You want everybody to chew on it mentally. Everybody writes. If you're going to write, everybody writes. You've got some people, particularly at these group desks working, they're not writing anywhere near their potential. Got these? Turn your partner quick and tell them the one favourite one you like. Go. Whoops. And back to me. Now, it looks like we've got a lot, lot of things to happen, but I've already gone through these with you without thinking. If you want a strong workplace culture, have an entry routine. Tell them what to do now. Have something on the desk ready for them to go. When they come in, have something ready so they're going to work in. Tight transitions. You lose hours handing out papers sometimes. Time it. Make it quick. Binder control. Know where the paper goes. Sant, stance, slant stands for sit up, lean forward, ask and answer questions, nod and track the speaker. Basically, it is a common form of getting people to pay attention. Every institution should have one. On your marks, have you got your stuff together? Have you got your materials? How many times do people turn up without stuff? My rule is if you haven't got a pencil, give me a shoe. Seat signals, don't yell at kids, just give them the look. <laughs> and props, I'll do some props in the last one. Got those? You haven't, but they're quick. Here we go. Expend a, expect 100%. If you're angry, tell them what to do. Don't use too many words, just say, sit up. Take your pen out of his ear. Strong voice. Strong voice is not a loud voice. It's when you square off, stand still, look at them like you mean it and give them a good decibel. 
doesn't have to be strong. I have seen very small little ladies make big NRL players cry. And if it's wrong, do it again. Great teachers make you repeat it till you get it. Sweat the details. Greet them at the threshold. That's why I shook your hand when you came in and learnt your name, because I think you matter and I showed you it. And no warnings. Get rid of warning programs. Two ticks on the board and you're going to get chucked. It just creates too much tension. If you're going to chuck them, chuck them. <laughs> if, you go, if you don't like what they do, go back to what to do. Stop that, put that down. Stand up for me. That's unacceptable. Sit down. Keep it real. And finally, I hope you've seen me do this. Have I been positively framed? Precise praise? Warm but strict? You bet. J factor? Got a little bit of joy? J factor. Emotionally constant is the hardest thing to teach anybody these days. Explain everything and normalize your mistakes. Isn't this, an awesome, isn't this an awesome discussion for us all to have? Who would like to see more of it? Who would like to do this in their institution? It's all there for you. So, simple thing. We need to be focused on what we do, have more awareness of our teaching, lots of repetition of this till we get it right, and we've got to celebrate awesomeness. <laughs> so next time you get a really difficult group and you find yourself going, uh, what am I going to do? You've already got the answer. <laughs> and if you want some more, just send us a good-sized disc and you can have all of the stuff that I've got. This is all for you. I wish someone had a told me this 30-something years ago. But for all of us, it's there and available for you now. Turn to your partner and tell them that they're wonderful. <laughs> and thank you for listening to me today. It's been far too short a time but I hope you've got some good stuff. Authorised by the Government of Western Australia, Perth.